Because I'm, uh, Jesus is not like looking at you and saying, what do you mean you doubt? I don't, I don't understand. What do you mean that you don't think I'm good? Like, I don't think Jesus sees it that way. But instead, I think he says, come, come, go get your husband. Go get it. Let's finally deal with this. Yes, bring it to me, please. I think that's what he's been waiting for. But then we come to church every Sunday and we just... Okay, shackles and bondages, you stay right there. I'm going to go to church. I'll be right back. And we can come here and we can pretend. Because we know all the right things to do. We know all the right things to say. At 10 o'clock, we start singing. I will clap my hands. I'll maybe move side to side. It's great. If I'm feeling a little extra, I'll do a little jazz hands. At around 10.30, we'll start worshiping. I'll lift my hand here, maybe lift a couple there, close my eyes a little bit saying a little off-key, maybe sometimes in-key. Then around 10.45, preacher will get up there and I'll say a couple, "Mm, yeah, mm, preach it, yeah. Then around 12, we'll give our tithes and do our offering. And we just are stuck in this this schedule, in this timeline of here, like, stay there. I'm going to stay there, shackles and bondages. I'll be right back. I'm just going to go to Jesus real quick. But then what do we do when everything else is said and done? We come right back. Because why? Because they stayed there. Because they weren't dealt with. Because you came here and, and, and did everything you were supposed to. You did everything correctly. But what? You come straight back home to your shackles and bondages. And I really hardly think that that's what Jesus wants. I think he does care so much about what we do here from 10 to 12. I think he does. He cares so much. But I think it grieves him with what we do with everything else. Because I would, I think Jesus would much rather you come here, let's deal with this, maybe not do everything we were supposed to in a time frame we were supposed to, but let's deal with, with what's going on. Why? Because they're just going to build up there. You want to keep leaving them at home? Fine. They're going to build up and they're going to get bigger and bigger. And then one day you can't even care. Like they're just gonna build up, and, and you're 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 doing yourself a disservice if you think that this Jesus only cares about your good side. And I don't think we truly understand the cross if that's what we think. Because the cross wasn't a pretty scene. It wasn't this glorious, like happy-go-lucky day. The cross is a scene of bloodshed. The cross is a scene of utter disgusting because the cross is a scene of a man dying. And if you've seen a man die, especially as brutally as Jesus did, it wasn't pretty. And so I think that says a lot about what we what we understand about the cross. Yes, the resurrection of Christ is glorious, and that part is great. But what happened before the resurrection? All that dirty stuff, all the nasty things took place before this glorious resurrection of Christ. And I think for us to understand Jesus, for us to understand Christianity in its, in its all its fullness, we need to be aware of both. Because the resurrection is great. What Jesus did on Easter Sunday, the resurrection Sunday, it's great and we should know about it and we should love it and we should, yes, celebrate it. But if you're stuck on that, then you don't really fully understand that if you don't know what happened before. You're missing a huge piece of the puzzle. And I think that that Jesus did what he did in the way that he did for a very specific purpose. I don't think that... this is obviously not like a random thing. Like Jesus did what he did because he needed to show that number one, number one, taking dealing with all your sin in that one time thing was not a pretty sight. Having all the sins of the world that are being done, that will be done on him was not pretty. And so don't expect this whole process to be pretty. We don't ever see the rest of the story of the Samaritan woman 
But if there's something I know about dealing with sin and confronting it head on, it's not pretty. There's parts of us that are going to get uncovered that we don't like. Parts of us that are going to get unraveled that uh, I don't want to show up. But you've got to get you've got to be willing to get through the dirty, to get through the glory, to to get down and dirty and be 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 willing to go through that to see this glorious resurrection. And I think that the same can happen in our life. And so we see um, Jesus, right? He says, go get your husband. And, and I think that's so key that if you remember anything else from this, just remember that Jesus, yes, offers eternal life, but he offers it in exchange of, of our sin. And I think that's so key that, that we, we sometimes forget. So if there's anything else that you forget, it's fine. Just remember that, that Jesus offers eternal life in exchange for our sin. And, um, and what we see here in, in the last verses um, is that Jesus says what? Salvation, salvation comes um, from the Jews, right? Which a lot of people are like, oh, what does that really mean? Let's just skip over it and pretend that never happened. But what Jesus is trying here, trying to say here is not that only Jews will be saved, but that salvation comes from, from the knowledge that the Jews just fortunately were, were a part of. In the same way, like Jesus is saying that, yes, this eternal life is in you. Now that you have accepted Jesus, now that you have this relationship with him, you have eternal life. And in the same way, you can offer eternal life to your to your best buddy, to your to your coworker, to your friend, to your family member. You have that. And this 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 eternal life um, is is within you. It's a swellspring uh, of life that that, um, that where you will never thirst again. And then he ends with this. He says, um, the time will come, whatever. However, indeed, it is already here when true, genuine worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking just such people as these as his worshipers. So when Jesus says this, he universalizes, universal, he makes it universal, he makes salvation universal, where he says, uh, I don't really care if you're a Samaritan or a Jew. There's a time, actually it's already here, where worshipers do not have to fall within this specific to be a worshiper, you must be a Jew. You must be from this bloodline. Nah, nah, nah. Like, no, Jesus is saying that a time is here already where Jesus, like, where a worshiper is not made of what their skin color is, is not made of what their social status is, but this worshiper, a true worshiper, is defined by um, someone who worships in spirit and truth, right? And we could just contextualize that to what that looks like today, where Jesus is saying, to be a worshiper, right? You don't have to have gone to church all your life. You don't have to have gone. You don't have to have memorized X amount of verses. No, to be a worshiper is to worship in spirit and truth. There's not this to-do list of, um, well, welcome to the church, new person. We're so glad you're here. Oh, what? You want to be a worshiper? Let me tell you, it's gonna be great. Here's a handbook of all the memory verses you need to know to be a worshiper. Here's how many times you have to pray within a day. This is the number of animals you have to sacrifice. Like, no. To be a worshiper, you worship in spirit and truth. So he universalizes, I think it's a word, um, salvation to everyone and not just not just um, people who fall within this category, right? And that's something that we need to learn in the church. 